Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, today I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Dr. Venkatesh Rudrapatna. Uh, Dr. Rudrapatna is a hematologist oncologist. He did his uh, training at the University of uh, Utah, both residency and fellowship. Um, you know, since uh, the therapeutic armamentarium in regards to the uh, management of malignant diseases is expanding, uh, so are the uh, uh, side effects of those treatments that we need to be aware of. And so the CME committee is very appreciative of the fact that uh, Dr. Rudrapatna was able to accept our invitation today uh, to review with us uh, some of those co complications and side effects. And without further ado, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Venkatesh Rudrapatna. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hallberg, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak again uh, for Grand Rounds. Uh, it's certainly an odd year for all of us, uh, but I think life goes on and uh, oncology goes on and uh, treatments go on. And so I thought um, this would be a good time to sort of dwell into some of the um, side effects and uh, complications we are noticing with the novel new therapeutics that uh, fortunately uh, has come up on us in oncology, which we're seeing um, sort of earth shattering and mind blowing uh, responses. But we have to be humbled by what we, little we know or what the body does and how we're influencing the body with these therapeutics. Uh, just a brief uh, overview of uh, what therapeutics and oncology look like and what the landscape is. Um, Back in the day, and we still use this, a traditional chemotherapy that we're all um, well averse with and know about. And these are the traditional things like your taxines, your anthracyclines, and other chemotherapies that we have all uh, read about and learned and uh, seen patients about and heard about. And then the next foray into uh, therapeutics started off with targeted therapies, uh, which were sort of the, the next generation smart drugs. And these are all the uh, pills that you see, including the drugs, very first drugs that were developed for uh, CML, the imatinib, the Gleevec medication. And then subsequently, there are a slew of other targeted drugs uh, that have been uh, developed so far. And most recently, we've had uh, immunotherapy as a big foray into oncology. Uh, there are some old school immunotherapy drugs. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about interferon and interleukin, which has been there for quite a while. That was the old school immunotherapy. And now we have uh, the new school immunotherapy. Uh, and then uh, the reason we have immunotherapy is uh, thanks to the clinical trials uh, that are advancing uh, oncology uh, and other areas of medicine, including treatments for COVID-19. Uh, just a refresher, I think I had this slide in my topic uh, last year, uh, but I thought it would be a good refresher to not get overwhelmed when you see these um, long-sounding names in oncology. You see them in the ER or you see them in primary care or other settings. So don't get overwhelmed by the names. Uh, some of these names I also cannot pronounce or sometimes I forget what they're meant for. But if you understand the the nomenclature, you may be able to sort of figure out what the side effects could be and uh, maybe get some sense of uh, what you're looking at. So when you're looking at a drug name, uh, the first thing you got to look at is, is the final three letters or two letters, the stem of the name. So if they end in a MAB, a MAB, they mean a monoclonal antibody. If they end in IB, they mean a small molecule targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So that's the first thing. So if any drug with the MAB, you can safely say it's a monoclonal antibody. So that at least helps you sort of go down the path of what potential side effects may be occurring for this patient that you're seeing that, and you're practicing in a non-oncological setting. The next stem, that sort of sub-stem that sort of helps um, tease some of these things out is the source of the drug and how is it made or manufactured. And that sort of helps guide some of the potential side effects. The ladders, the Xi, Zhu, and the Mu sort of help uh, determine whether they have a fully humanized, uh, humanized mouse or a chimeric uh, component. So for example, 
the rituximab, the Zmab, tells us that it's a chimeric human and mouse. So you would expect that there may be a higher chances of having reactions because it's a chimeric protein, as opposed to a fully humanized version, such as ipilimumab, you might anticipate that maybe there's a lower chance of having some sort of reactions to the drug. And then the second uh, step after that would give you an idea of how do these drugs work. Uh, if there is a CI, uh, for example, uh, preceding the, the MAB and the source of the drug, then you know how they work. So bevacizumab, which is a very common drug used across the board in, in ophthalmology and other sectors as well, uh, the C means it's working on the circulatory system. So you know it's working on the blood vessels, and then you may be able to anticipate some of the side effects of bleeding and hypertension uh, accordingly. So you may not even know what the drug does, but if they come into your practice, you might be able to have a sense of, oh, am I looking at a stroke? Am I looking at bleeding because of this drug? Uh, Lee, for example, is uh, some drugs that work on the immune system. And the T, for example, works on the tumor. I'm not going to dwell a lot on the small molecules as is, uh, we're going to sort of not be dwelling a lot on uh, today's topic, but it gives you a sense of, again, similar concepts on the mechanistic um, action of these drugs, and thereby you may be able to sort of foresee what the potential side effects could be. Uh, oncoimmunotherapy has exploded uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, we have started off with cytokines, like I alluded to before, interleukin interferon used in hepatitis and prior in melanomas. And since then, we have sort of branched out in so many other areas of immunology uh, and immunotherapeutics that has uh, changed the landscape. The most cutting-edge treatments today are the CAR T cells. Uh, we've got approval by FDA for treatment of pediatric uh, leukemias. And uh, here you actually take out the antigens or immune cells from the body, the tumor cells. You genetically program them, um, with the T cells, and you make them recognize the antigens on the surface of the cancer cells, and then you inject them back into the person. And these drugs can cause cytokine storms, and, but they have been sort of changing the paradigm of treatment of uh, these cancers. Uh, there is oncolytic viruses. Um, the TVEC vaccine, uh, which is now approved for melanoma, is again a new spectrum in the treatment of um, cancers. There is adoptive B cell and T cell therapies. There are other vaccines. This was a Provenge or Cipicel T is now approved for prostate cancer and has been used for quite some time. There are dendritic cell treatments. There are bispecific T cell engagers. There's synthetic antibodies. And then the mainstay of treatments, which most of our talk today will be, is about the checkpoint inhibitors and, and uh, CTLA-4 antibodies, which you're all probably seeing a lot on TV ads on, uh, for these various drugs. So the majority of the talk will be sort of dwelling on the side effects of this category of drugs uh, that we are sort of are the mainstay of a lot of the oncological treatments today. But keep in mind that all these new other therapeutics will probably be uh, mainstream, uh, either in large academic centers, such as the CAR T cells, which are already mainstream, and they may eventually trickle down into a packaged product that we might start using here at Mary at some point in time as well. Uh, just to sort of briefly allude to the mechanisms of uh, some of the immune checkpoint uh, treatments, keeping in mind that um, cancer cells require antigen-presenting cells. And so this is sort of one of the 101 of uh, immunology. So the antigen-presenting cells present uh, these antigens to the T cells to activate them or inactivate them. And uh, researchers have found two separate pathways. One is called a CTLA-4 pathway, where the CTLA-4 antigen uh, is bound to the CTLA-4 receptor in the T cells, and then it inactivates them. So the red pathway is showing uh, inactivation of T cells, so making the T cells uh, sleepy and fatigued. 
So then they were able to come up with uh, CTLA-4 inhibitors, uh, which is the ipilimumab or Yervoy for melanoma, which is blocking uh, this pathway and as a result activates the T cells to be able to recognize the antigen-presenting cells with the cancer and then accordingly take action. Uh, the screen on the bottom shows you the, the pathway for the PDL1 and the PD1 pathway for which uh, the two uh, physicians and researchers received the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, uh, showing the activation of the tumor cells PDL1 pathway, which is again an antigen presenting to the PD1 receptor on the T cells, uh, causing immune fatigue. Um, and the PDL1 uh, binds to the PD1 pathway, the T cells get sleepy, uh, and they fail to recognize that there's cancer in the body. And so they were able to come up with drugs that block both the PDL1 as well as the PD1 and are able to develop um, activated T cells, which in turn can result in um, cancer killing properties. So that sort of has been a big uh, shift in the way we're treating cancers. Now, given that they're activating and uh, tweaking the T cells, this can result in various side effects. So uh, there's this whole slew of uh, we call IRAEs in abbreviation, which is immune-related adverse events. Um, this is sort of a whole category within uh, the side effect staging pathways within oncology. Uh, going back to the mechanisms, uh, there have been many proposed mechanisms uh, that have been uh, brought forth as to why some of these immune modeling drugs are causing some of the side effects they do cause. Some pathways um, talk about T cells that share the antigens that are expressed both in tumors and on the cancer, uh, non-cancer cells, so resulting in um, side effects. So the heart, for example, might express the same antigens as present on tumor cells, causing inflammation in the heart, causing myocarditis, for example. Or the body develops antibodies or autoantibodies and these have been reported in uh, thyroid and un other endocrine abnormalities. There's also direct binding of these antibodies to target organs. Um, some um, basic signed pathways have shown that the CTLA-4 pathways uh, that are expressed uh, in use of drugs of the ipilimumab can cause direct effect on the pituitary gland and cause uh, pan hypopituitarism. And then there's also other pathways of overactivation of the adaptive and innate immune system, which can then result in some cytokine changes and dysregulation resulting in a lot of the side effects. So this is kind of a fascinating new area of research that's underway as to why are we having these side effects and then in turn can uh, augment and um, sort of dull down some of these side effects. Um, again, just briefly, some of these pathways including uh, B cell mediated, T cell mediated, uh, CTLA expression. And then there's some research also looking into the, the gut microbiome as a potential pathway as to why some of these drugs work and also why some of these drugs have a worse or a better side effect profile in, in some patients. So this is an uh, area of research and we'll probably be hearing a lot more of uh, these mechanisms of uh, adverse events. As a result, um, if I were to put up COVID-19, what it's affecting, uh, the coron novel coronavirus, it would be pretty similar to this screen here. It can pretty much affect any organ of the body. So when I tell my patients uh, what are the side effects are, I tell them some of the common ones, but then I tell them with the caveat that it can potentially affect any organ of the body because it's your own immune system that's activated and how it comes in attacks your own immune system. Uh, your own immune system attacking your own self is a little bit hard to predict. And as this uh, chart shows, uh, it, no organ is spared uh, from the side effect profile of these drugs. And as far as timing, there have been um, uh, data pulled from the various um, plenary studies that have uh, gotten these drugs approved. And they've shown um, some of the timings for the CTLA-4 antibody drugs uh, as you can see, they're sort of following a similar pathway with the PD-1. Uh, there may be a slight difference in the uh, grade and the peak of these curves, but some toxicities, such as colitis, are the ones that occur earlier on, and 
the pneumonitis are somewhere in between, and then the nephritis and others tend to be longer-term potential toxicities. And as this graph in the bottom shows, that when you combine both these two drugs, you're sort of squishing the side effects sometimes earlier on. So you might see uh, the colitis a little bit earlier, but also a higher peak potentially. And same with other side effects like the hormone dysfunction, the blue line, uh, you're seeing a higher peak. So there's probably a higher risk of having these toxicities and side effects when you combine uh, drugs from two different mechanisms of actions. Uh, they may be a better response, but proportionally uh, more side effects. Uh, another uh, from the Annals of Oncology in 2017, uh, just giving a spectrum of all the various side effects, and we talked about that they can occur in every organ of the body, uh, ranging from um, top to bottom. Uh, this is uh, from Nature, uh, again, giving you a percentage incidence of the various side effects uh, again, you can see uh, as you start combining drugs, the severity of these incidents of these side effects are larger or higher than uh, individual drugs alone. And um, they're not zero, they're not 100%. Um, there are some that are higher, 40%, 30% risks of having these amount of side effects, and some that are rare, sort of less than 1%, less than 5%. Uh, chances of having these side effects. So I thought I would uh, proceed with the rest of the talk by giving you examples of uh, true patients in my practice. Um, so to give you some realistic uh, case scenarios of what to expect uh, that you all might as well see uh, in your practices uh, as you see our patients coming into your uh, environments. Uh, the first case is a patient of ours uh, He's 65, he uh, was diagnosed recently with metastatic lung cancer and uh, had a high PDL one expression, and so he got started on treatment with pembrolizumab. Again, going back to the, even if you didn't know what this drug meant, you know, it's a MAB, it's a ZU, and the LI. So LI is the immune system, so you can say, oh, this is immune modulating antibody drug. Uh, and so, as soon as uh, he started uh, infusion, about a few minutes into the infusion, he started experiencing facial flushing. He started to get short of breath. Uh, his back and his uh, flank started hurt. And uh, this is a classical infusion reaction. Fortunately, we're not seeing a lot of this uh, with these uh, newer immune checkpoint drugs. These are more classically with uh, um, monoclonal antibodies uh, that are used for hematological, like the rituximabs, the, the CMABs, which are the humanized uh, mouse uh, dual monoclonal antibodies. But in this case, yes, this person did have some of the uh, infusion reaction toxicities. So we stopped the treatment, gave him a, a dose of Benadryl and some steroids, and the symptoms went away. Uh, majority of patients, I would say 99.9% .9 don't require any pre-medications, uh, thankfully, and they're able to endure these treatments without reaction. But there's a small subset that do have this reaction. And fortunately for this patient, his subsequent treatments did not require any pre-medications. He's handled them well subsequently, and he's almost three years out not needing any uh, pre-medications. So infusion reactions are not very frequent, uh, and only about less than 1% uh, in literature has uh, reported a very severe life-threatening reactions that have required uh, discontinuation of treatment. The NCCN guidelines um, recommend some of the pathways. I won't necessarily dwell into a lot of the NCCN guidelines here, uh, but just to give you an idea, and most clinicians and providers have access to these guidelines. You are welcome to create a login and be able to look at some of these guidelines, uh, not only for this particular topic, but as for other oncological topics that, uh, that you might come across and would need some help uh, guiding your management. Um, you're always welcome to call us as well. Uh, again, mild, you can certainly hold it and then consider pre-medications. Moderate, you might have to consider premedications with subsequent treatments, and then severe, then we may have to consider discontinuation. And fortunately, these are very mild uh, or very low in incidence. 
Uh, case number two uh, is a patient of mine. She's 60. Uh, she has a history of uh, melanoma that unfortunately was metastatic. And she started on ipilimumab, uh, which uh, after three cycles, she this was a drug uh, that was initially introduced prior to nivolumab. So this is a CTLA-4 antibody prior to the nivolumab and the pembrolizumab drugs were approved. So this is a few years ago when I treated this patient. Three cycles later, she presented uh, as if she couldn't get out of bed. She was extremely fatigued. The family brought in saying she was very confused. And uh, in the clinic, we noted her sodium was extremely low at 120. Uh, she was very hypokalemic at 2.8. And then admission, we obtained cortisol levels, which are pretty much undetectable. And her TSH levels were through the roof. Um, so she has developed uh, endocrine side effects from these uh, CTLA-4 antibodies. So we started on um, steroids hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone and levothyroxine. And within 48 hours, she was a, a different person. Uh, the categories of endocrine toxicities range from, again, top to bottom. Uh, they can cause panohypopit, hypophysitis, hypothyroid and hyperthyroid, uh, adrenal insufficiency, and diabetes, um, to name a few. Uh, again, some of the guidelines uh, recommending how we should be managing some of these patients for the patients who have asymptomatic thyroid abnormalities, if the TSH is not that elevated, we can continue treatment and not necessarily initiate thyroid treatment. For those that have significantly elevated TSH levels uh, and are not symptomatic, we still would recommend starting on replacement. And similarly to the reverse of the hyperthyroid state. Um, and so there is uh, these pathways which are slowly trickling in and helping us guide some of these uh, side effects that we're experiencing. Uh, similarly, there's a concept of central hypothyroidism as well as hypophysitis, which is kind of what our, my patient here experienced, uh, both uh, thyroid and adrenal insufficiency. Um, and some of these uh, guidelines would recommend obtaining MRI scans to evaluate for abnormalities in the pituitary gland as well. And then a lot of these patients will end up um, needing uh, long-term steroid replacement, um, both fludrocortisone and hydrocortisone, and they end up needing alert bracelets like our other endocrine patients who have not received immunotherapies. Uh, the third case uh, is our 71-year-old with, uh, again, with melanoma. Uh, she's fairly... A recent patient of mine within the last year and a half, she presented with a large um, groin uh, node, which was biopsied to be consistent with malignant melanoma without a clear source. So we uh, decided to start her on, it was fairly large, it would have required a very big excision and caused significant um, lymphedema. So we decided to start her on treatment up front. So I started on a combination of the immune checkpoint and the CTLA-4, the nivolumab and ipilimumab. She completed four cycles of this, and she had a fantastic response. Uh, we could barely feel the lump uh, after these four cycles, so showing the, the high efficacy of these drugs. But again, dwelling on the potential side effects, she, I saw her, she was set up to go for her surgery at Mayo Clinic, and she started experiencing, like my previous patient, significant fatigue and postural hypotension. And I checked her sodium in clinic that day, and as you can see, that was her graph for her previous cycles, and bang, she dropped to 120. And uh, so we admitted her. Uh, I had uh, Dr. Rivadinera help us out in this patient, and he did a cocytropin stimulation test, and uh, she had an inadequate response and suggesting that uh, she has experienced the endocrine toxicity of uh, this doublet of uh, treatments. And so in this case, she started on hydrocortisone, and she's had significant improvement. And fortunately for her, she has uh, undergone a successful surgery. She was able to deal with the stress. She got a little bit extra stress to steroids during her surgery. And after she finished surgery, I have continued her on nivolumab. Um, without any aggravation of her 
uh, endocrine dysfunction. She is completing one year of treatment shortly, probably end of this year she'll be finishing it. She's in complete remission and her uh, symptoms have not worsened. So she is continuing on hydrocortisone. I'm hoping eventually she may be able to wean, be weaned off of this, but we will have to see how she does uh, when she's off of therapy. Uh, again, some guidelines on how we manage primary adrenal insufficiency in the context of um, these drugs, uh, sort of what levels we have to check, the cocytropin stimulation test, and then accordingly replacement of hydrocortisone and or prednisone uh, with fludrocortisone, uh, which is an important thing. We got to combine both pathways to um, keep these patients supported. And then again, we have to think about alert bracelets for some of these patients. Uh, next case. A uh, patient of mine with uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma uh, was started on nivolumab, uh, which is Optivo, after he had progressed on uh, pezopinib. Again, all these long terms, just if you remember, if it's an IB, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So it, this is a pill form of a drug. Nivolumab, again, LU is the immune system. The MAB is an antibody. So this is an antibody affecting the immune system. And after his second dose of nivolumab, he came in, and as you can see, his, his one of the highest blood sugars I've seen, almost 1,200 was his blood sugar. So he was admitted to the ICU, was in DKA, and we had our endocrinologist help us out in managing his case. And we obtained CT scans, and the immune checkpoint drug had caused some havoc in his pancreas. As you can see in this screen, it has caused pancreatitis. There's a significant swelling and inflammation in the pancreas. So unfortunately, in this case, uh, it was a fairly high-grade toxicity with that high of a blood sugar levels. We had to discontinue this treatment going forward. Uh, he is currently on um, long-term insulin, and I had to switch him to a next-generation IB drug, a tyrosine kinase drug. And in fact, I've had uh, one other case just recently in the hospital. Uh, she was in the combination of both these drugs for small cell lung cancer and just presented with blood sugars of about five, four to 500 and with similar presentations of DKA and it's now requiring insulin, suggesting that these are potential things we all have to be vigilant about uh, for uh, these drugs. Again, some of the guidelines for the NCCN, uh, if there is mild hyperglycemia, uh, then you manage them and you're able to continue those treatments. If there's a severe case of um, hyperglycemia, and then in that case, we certainly uh, should think about holding immunotherapy. A lot of these decisions are a little bit challenging because if these are life-changing, cancer-curing drugs, should we continue this on? It makes it a very, very difficult decision in these cases. So we have to uh, base it on, based on the grade and the severity of the side effects and what other options these patients have for their treatments. Next case, uh, again, a patient of mine with uh, stage three melanoma, um, and he started receiving adjuvant. Adjuvant means treatments given after uh, surgery to try to decrease the risk of recurrence. And he received ipilimumab, which is a Yervoy. Again, this is a few years ago before the, the newer checkpoint drugs got approved. Two cycles later, he came into my clinic with complaints of literally 10 to 20 bowel wounds a day. Uh, we admitted him to the hospital, uh, started hydrating him. We obtained uh, stool studies, which were all negative. Uh, he underwent a colonoscopy, which showed uh, colitis with cryptitis. And uh, on your right-hand screen, you can see some of these crypt changes that you can see with some of these. They're not necessarily specific for immune checkpoint drugs, but it just shows that these drugs can cause similar cryptitis and colitis changes that your um, sort of index of suspicion should be higher. So we treated him with high dose of steroids uh, as per guidelines for many weeks with a slow titration down. So he had an improvement up front he got significantly better. We discharged him home. Uh, three weeks later, when he was tapering down his steroids, he was actually still, uh, I think, at 40 milligrams dose. He came in with explosive diarrhea, almost back to what he was uh, before at his presentation. So we had to readmit him. Uh, we put him on higher doses of steroids again. 
without much of an improvement. And unfortunately, in this case, we had to use an antibody, a different antibody, to treat some of these types. So, so the infliximab and remicade, and these drugs are used for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, for inflammatory bowel disease. So we have to pull one of these drugs to try to calm the colitis that's being created by these immune checkpoint drugs. And after one treatment of the infliximab, he had complete resolution of his diarrhea. And he ended up getting one additional dose of that, and he has since not needed any further um, treatments for his diarrhea. So showing us um, what effects we can be doing and that we have to start uh, using some other immune-modulating drugs to treat the side effects of immune-modulating drugs. Uh, again, um, the NCCN guidelines, uh, they're mild. Again, keeping in mind, we got to make sure it's not infection. Got to start thinking about other potential toxicities. Always be thinking of C. diff in our patient population or in and out of the healthcare system. So we got to make sure that those are not the case. And then mild, uh, we can treat them with Imodium and Lamotil uh, and then continue with treatment. If moderate, you hold immunotherapy and use steroids. And then there's severe, uh, such as in our patient, we had to discontinue the medication and then use other immune modeling drugs such as infliximab, which we did in, in his case. The same patient continued on. He unfortunately developed a metastatic recurrence. Um, and given he was on a CTLA-4 antibody and he had diarrhea, I said, let's try uh, uh, the immune checkpoint um, drug pembrolizumab on him. And he has continued on pembrolizumab without any evidence of diarrhea. So his colitis has not recurred, fortunately. But unfortunately, he has been experiencing significant arthralgias to the point where he can't even get out of bed at some days. So we've had to treat him um, again with steroids um, after we've done an exhaustive autoimmune workup. He's seen a rheumatologist as well. All those testings have been negative to indicate any coexisting autoimmune arthritis that's causing some of these problems. And he started on, again, a higher dose of steroids, and his steroids have been weaned down, and he's currently on a very low-dose maintenance prednisone, and he's actually doing fairly well. He's continuing on pembrolizumab, and he is cancer-free uh, almost a um, year out since his diagnosis of his metastatic uh, setting. And the arthralgias associated with these immune checkpoints tend to be a little bit later in the course of uh, treatments. They're not as early as the colitis, um, and they tend to be months or even uh, later on after starting these drugs. Again, uh, the guidelines showing some of the pathways. Mild, you can use typical arthritis uh, NSAIDs and Tylenol if, uh, if it's beneficial. Moderate, you may have to continue with prednisone. And then severe, uh, I have not had one as yet, but we may have to consider, again, immune-modulating drugs such as methotrexate or infl infliximab and other uh, drugs that are commonly used in rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune arthritis. Uh, next patient, again, a patient of mine with uh, metastatic lung cancer to the brain. Uh, he was on nivolumab. Uh, he was on it uh, every two weeks for multiple cycles. It was a cycle 10 that I saw him in clinic, and uh, his kidney numbers were okay um, the preceding cycle, and he presented. That day, his creatinine had bumped up to 4.5. So he was in acute kidney injury. We admitted him to the hospital, uh, had exhaustive workup by our uh, nephrology colleagues, without a clear smoking gun here as far as what could have triggered this acute kidney injury in this setting. Maybe there was a little ATN, uh, maybe some dehydration. That was the initial speculation. So he had some improvement, uh, but then he sort of plateaued off and he's developed a, a chronic kidney disease subsequently. Uh, fortunately for him, he has leveled off at a creatinine of 1.5. And then the hypothesis is that this is probably uh, mediated from immune checkpoint. Um, fortunately for him, a gentleman with stage four uh, metastatic lung cancer to the brain is 
uh, NED or stable disease four years out on these treatments. Again, showing that these drugs are great and fantastic, but they come with a price. And in his case, the price is some CKD and it's holding steady. We've been able to control it and he seems to be not being aggravated since his initial peak. And we're continuing on nivolumab um, with some dose adjustments and he continues to be um, having a great response. Uh, again, some of the guidelines showing how we should be managing some of these uh, mild, one could consider holding and then repeating and if it stabilizes, if it's moderate, uh, again, you can consider them some steroids uh, in these patient population. And then severe, again, the theme of the game is we have to consider other immune modulating drugs to try to alter the effects that this immune modulating drug has caused in the body. Um, next patient, again, a uh, patient of mine who was 83, uh, a smoker. He was diagnosed with squamous cell lung cancer, poorly differentiated. He uh, was stage 2A after surgery. He had a, a surgery done here at our institution. And he underwent um, chemotherapy with carboplatin and taxol for four cycles. Uh, and he did quite well. We had a study open here uh, looking into the role of immune checkpoint drugs as an additional treatment to try to minimize the risk of recurrence of lung cancer. So he started on nivolumab, uh, which is Optivo. And a few cycles into that, he started developing, you can see the rashes. Uh, this is his kneecap. This is his um, hand. And this was, um, I think, his chest area. And he developed severe psoriatic rash. Uh, no clear prior history. He had some scales from a long time ago um, for his report, but this was a severe uh, reaction uh, of a psoriatic flare or a psoriatic um, bounce back in his case that developed from these immune checkpoints. So he had to be pulled out of the study uh, seen by our dermatology colleagues, uh, was put on strong potency steroids, uh, eventually needed a course of uh, systemic steroids to try to control his uh, very severe psoriatic uh, flare-up. Uh, another patient of mine, uh, again going on the dermatological theme, uh, 73, he's got metastatic renal cell carcinoma. He uh, failed the oral drugs, at least one of them, so I started him on nivolumab uh, in 2018. He was starting to have responses um, on imaging, but unfortunately, he presented with this blistering kind of bullous rash, as you can see on his scalp and then on his uh, torso. Uh, this was pretty much everywhere. Um, biopsy was done by our dermatology and uh, consistent with uh, bullous ephemphigoid. Um, so he was treated with, again, topical and systemic steroids, and he needed systemic antibiotics. Unfortunately, I had to discontinue this medication. This was uh, quite severe uh, and um, affecting his quality of life. And so he's off of uh, this treatment now. He's on a second uh, generation uh, oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor. His rash is still very mild. Still, I can see some of these scars, and there's a few bullae that occasionally pop up in his case that has required intermittent courses of antibiotics. Um, again, some of the guidelines showing how we should be managing some of this uh, bullet dermatitis. Again, the same theme, mild, you can use topical and continued treatment. Moderate or severe, you have to continue systemic steroids and then discontinuing things. Rarely there's been in, in the uh, literature has been reported Stevens Johnson's and toxic uh, epidermal necrolysis has also been reported using some of these drugs. Uh, next patient of mine, he's 74, uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma, and was started on nivolumab, uh, had been on it for three months. He presented the Mercium for worsening cough and hypoxia. He could barely walk uh, from his living room uh, to the kitchen. Um, in the ER, a CT chest, which is kind of common, what we always see for a lot of our pneumonia patients, showed uh, this worsening consolidative picture here and the ground glass changes uh, bilaterally in his uh, lungs. So he ended up being admitted to the hospital, and uh, he was started on treatment as if he had uh, pneumonia. 
and he had very minimal improvement over the next few days. So we had Dr. Mahini come in and um, he performed a bronchoscopy on this person and revealed uh, that most of his infection workup was negative. Uh, cytology testing was negative for malignancy as well. So he was put on uh, this prolonged antibiotic course with the presumption that this is still pneumonia for a while, but he continued to have worsening status. His pulmonary status did not improve. Then we had to pull the immune checkpoint related toxicity as the possible culprit here. And we initiated steroids uh, at high doses uh, and then slowly tapered down. And as you can see, um, a couple of months later, his lungs have completely cleared up. He has finished his prednisone taper over the last many months, uh, and he's off of steroids now. His lungs continue to be clear. Unfortunately, given his grade and severity of his uh, toxicities, I have not been able to reinitiate uh, immune checkpoint, and so he's on targeted drugs at this time. Uh, a similar patient of mine uh, was in the combination, presented with similar complaints, similar story, was in the hospital for a while, got bronchoscopy, got antibiotics with no improvement. And just to give you an idea of various manifestations of these drugs, the various patterns that can be presenting. Uh, so it's very, very tricky, very, very uh, deceptive to distinguish this between a pneumonia and these immune checkpoints. So all these features that we see can be presented in uh, traditional pneumonias or atypical infections as well. So it's one of those uh, um, diagnoses of exclusion categories. Uh, again, similarly, guidelines, mild cases, you can continue on. Uh, moderate to severe cases, you have to stop, do the bronchoscopy, rule out other infections, treat them with steroids, and then potentially discontinue the immune checkpoint drugs. Um, Another case, 55-year-old patient with bladder cancer with uh, no prior coronary disease. He was being treated with atezolizumab or atezo. Uh, he presented with shortness of breath and chest pains uh, to the emergency room uh, in order to have elevated troponins uh, and echo showed a decreased EF. So he underwent the conventional cardiology workup by our colleagues. Uh, angiogram, uh, stress test, all those things were negative. No blockage was noted. Um, Infection disease was involved and viral workup was all negative. Autoimmune testing was negative. Then we had to pull out the immune checkpoint uh, as a potential culprit. So we started treatment with steroids and then he had uh, improvement in his ejection fractions. So again, this is a person we had to discontinue the immune checkpoint uh, that resulted in myocarditis. Uh, as you can see, it can, as my very first few slides, it can pretty much affect any organ. It can cause arrhythmias, it can cause myocarditis, it can present exactly as if you had a coronary disease. It can cause stress-induced takasubo um, myocarditis, it can cause pericardial effusions, it can cause vasculitis. So it can cause the whole gamut of presentations that we all have to be cognizant about. Again, NCCN guidelines showing some of the pathways Again, take home as steroids here, and if things are not improving, we have to use other immune modeling drugs such as IVIG and ATG and CELCEPT. Um, next patient of mine, 55-year-old with metastatic melanoma uh, on pembrolizumab for over three years. Uh, in fact, this is a patient of uh, mine who was enrolled on the initial pembrolizumab studies for melanoma. Um, at an outside institution, an academic institution, and then he transferred his care here to continue treatments when, his, uh, when the drug got uh, approved by the FDA. He had been doing quite well for a long time, and then one day he comes into clinic for his treatment, and you can see his LFT just jumped to the roof. And I started uh, asking him further questions on was he you know, taking something new, new medications, and then finally I got the story that he was starting to take some green tea extracts. Uh, fortunately for him, this was the culprit, and we discontinued this, and his liver functions normalized. So take-home message here is be cognizant that, yes, immune checkpoints can be this, uh, cause a lot of these troubles, but we got to rule out the common things first and rule out other potential um, culprits in this case. And in this case, it was a medication, herbal supplements that was causing his liver function abnormalities. 
So those are some of my um, examples of patients that I've seen in my practice um, since we've had uh, use of these drugs. Then the question is, what do we do for these patients who've had some of these toxicities? So there's a little bit of a conflict in the data. If you look at the literature, there's, uh, it's still evolving. I think it is a very um, nuanced approach. We have to adopt where these patients take into consideration the grade of the side effects, what alternative treatments this person has, how severe is their cancer, and how life-threatening is the cancer, how life-threatening is the side effects. Um, as you've seen in some of my patients, they have gone on to receive some of these treatments without trouble. In some of these cases, we have to discontinue them because their risk of causing life-threatening complications are so severe that we have to discontinue that despite immune modulating supportive treatments. How can we get better at predicting some of these uh, side effects and potentials for uh, who of these patients, or uh, which of these patients can actually uh, develop these side effects? It's a science and evolution, uh, so that data is yet to be identified. There's some talk about circulating cytokine levels to pre- and post-treatment to see if that actually predicts some of these. There's some research into microRNA um, data to try to see if that can predict that. We have a study open currently uh, that is recruiting patients that have developed uh, severe side effects from immune checkpoint drugs. So it's a national study. It's a national biorepository, which is going to be collecting samples of blood as well as tissue samples to try to uh, help us guide uh, why some of these patients are developing and what we should be doing with these patient populations. So uh, if you happen to see some of these patients, please, uh, in various settings, the ER or in primary care, certainly get a hold of us. And um, we'd like to get these patients on this study. Um, I think there's a, a short window of time when they have to be enrolled uh, on this study. So that's kind of a fascinating new area that uh, we're investigating. And then the guidelines sort of recommend some of these uh, various monitoring parameters that we all uh, should be following, some of which are uh, built into our treatment protocols uh, within our EPIC system and some of which uh, we are following in our clinic exams, um, like monitoring the thyroid function labs, uh, potentially looking at uh, EKGs, uh, potentially looking at troponin levels uh, for some of the patients who are at a higher risk. So that's sort of this uh, area that's evolving again as to uh, how much of this we should be monitoring. And so, um, before I end my talk, I had some take-home messages for all of you. Uh, that was a, kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, immuno-oncology there. Uh, so immunotherapy is uh, fascinating and is here to stay, and you will be seeing a lot of new treatments. Uh, every day you'll see a new MAB show up on your doorstep, and that's here to stay, and uh, you'll be seeing these drugs. Uh, be cognizant that it can impact any organ of the body or any system, and as a result can cause varying side effects, as we have seen in many examples today. And very important, you got to rule out other things first. Common things being common, rule out infections, rule out medications, rule out other things before we blame immune therapies. And if nothing else works, you can pull up the steroid card to try to maintain and control some of the side effects of these treatments. And uh, please certainly get in touch with the on-call doctor or anyone of, in the oncology team if you have any doubts on whether you should be using steroids for these patients um, because there's some data questioning whether these can negate the effects of the immune checkpoint drugs. So feel free to page us, call us, email us uh, if you have doubts on using steroids in the setting of patients who are on immune checkpoint treatments. Uh, that was a whirlwind tour of immunotherapy. Uh, be hope Happy to open it up to questions um, for the audience. Thank you. So I have a question about um, how do you handle informed consent, verbal, written? Um, typically, it's both. It's both verbally um, done uh, in the clinic as well as um, it's documented in the chart uh, in EPIC about the side effects. There's a lot of teaching done. We give them, uh, there's some of these uh, companies actually provide us forms where the patients have to actually fill out their side effect profile each treatment cycle. And so we have been using some of those uh, 
forms to help us uh, manage some of these side effects and monitor them. Any other questions or comments or um, be happy to answer. Uh, Dr. Gerbrock had a question. Would you use these AQEBs, AGEBs? Uh, I'm not sure. Could you elaborate, Dr. Gerbrock? Uh, the question is, uh, would we consider using these in patients with solid organ transplants? And that's a very, very fascinating and very interesting question. Uh, it, the data is very, very controversial. Uh, there is literature suggesting that in some cases it has been reportedly used and has been safe, but the side effect prof, uh, profile and the odds of rejection are significantly higher. Uh, so I have personally not used them so far, and in fact I do have a few um, transplant, solar organ transplant patients that have cancers that I have not been brave enough uh, as yet to use these drugs. But there's some literature saying that we could be potentially considering using these uh, with the caveat that there are potential risks for um, severe rejections in these patients. Uh, we have a question, why patients develop type 1 dose meds destroy all the pancreatic beta cells and not producing insulin at all, and is it permanent? Um, yes, there is, again, immune mediated uh, mechanism of uh, destruction of the pancreatic cells. Um, and a lot of these patients end up needing uh, long-term insulin without uh, recovery. Uh, it's a little hard to say because these drugs are new, so we don't know um, in the long term, you know, 10 years or not, if there's going to be recovery of these uh, functioning. So far in the patients that I've had these toxicities, uh, at least the one that I showed you, uh, I've yet to see a significant improvement. Yes, the insulin dosing has improved and has decreased, uh, but they have uh, uh, still needed to stay on insulin. So uh, it is, uh, it's a science that is still uh, to be determined uh, whether these patients will eventually be able to get off of uh, insulin and their beta function and the pancreatic cells will uh, resume working. I think it's one o'clock and um, I appreciate your time and um, listening on a busy work day. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Um, thank you. <laughs>